Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we bring you the pros and cons of a no-fly zone in Ukraine and an interview from the front lines of its fight against Russia. Plus, the B-21 Raider bomber starts its ground tests and a $34 million data contract. And finally, we get an inside look at an all-volunteer force of drone hobbyists fighting the Russians. It's those stories and more in the latest news from the Pentagon to the platoon on this edition of Defense News Weekly. followed news out of Ukraine, you've definitely heard talks about no-fly zones. Ukrainians are requesting one, while NATO countries don't seem likely to set one up. To help us learn a little bit more about this is retired Air Force Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, who was the commander overseeing the Operation Northern Watch no-fly zone in northern Iraq in the late 1990s. There, he flew 82 combat missions as an F-15 pilot. Lieutenant General Deptula joins us now. Welcome, sir. Let's start at the basics. What exactly is a no-fly zone? Many folks assume that somehow a no-fly zone is a magical way to disperse an enemy without uh, bloodshed. But what I would tell you is nothing could be further from reality. In fact, a no-fly zone's not a military half measure, but it's a full-fledged combat operation uh, designed to deprive an enemy of its air power capabilities. And therefore, it involves direct and sustained uh, war fighting. Um, it essentially is the usurpation and control of the airspace, as well as the significant ground elements of an adversary's uh, air defense system. So it's not just about, as many people think, shooting down other airplanes. It's also about eliminating the enemy's ability to shoot down the aircraft uh, on the friendly side that are there to enforce that no-fly zone. As you alluded to, it's a lot more, more complicated than that. And you were the commander of Operation Northern Watch in Northern Iraq in 1998 and 1999. What do you have to prepare to have a, a no-fly zone? The first piece are going to be the command and control aircraft. Um, these are aircraft such as uh, AWACS, which is an acronym that stands for Airborne Warning and Control System. Um, then there's a whole series of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, aircraft, things like the Global Hawk, remotely piloted aircraft, the RC-135, which is known as Rivet Joint. This collects enemy electronic signals and communications intelligence. Drones like the MQ-9, aircraft that can collect information and make sure that the friendly aircraft enforcing the no-fly zone know where the enemy is and the kinds of systems they're operating. Then there's suppression of enemy air defense aircraft. These are aircraft like uh, Navy EF-18Gs, the F-16s, um, F-22s, aircraft that can hone in on adversary air defenses and eliminate them. Then there are the counter-air aircraft. These are the ones that people normally think about populating a no-fly zone. This is F-22s, F-15Cs, uh, Rafales, Typhoons, if we were involved in a European scenario. Uh, they're the ones that take on any any aircraft of the adversaries that might attempt to penetrate the no-fly zone. Then you have a series of strike aircraft like F-35s, F-15Es, F-16s that can attack 
elements of the enemy's integrated air defense systems. And then of course you have your air refueling aircraft to keep everyone airborne. Uh, and then a combat search and rescue capability. So you can see it's, it's not a handful of airplanes of one type. It's not just a bunch of fighters. It's fighters, bombers, command and control aircraft, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance aircraft, refueling aircraft, um, search and recovery aircraft. Um, so pretty complex operation. This would be effectively taking it one step further and having NATO countries in combat with the Russians? Yeah, that's, the, that's exactly right. Um, uh, th this is full out, full out warfare. Um, you know, and if you go back to the history of the original no-fly zones, the original one in Iraq was stood up in um, uh, right after uh, 2001, the cessation of hostilities because Saddam Hussein um, was persecuting the Kurds in the north. Um, we were still in a state of war with Iraq. So, um, you know, we, we set up uh, what was originally called Operation Provide Comfort uh, to basically prevent Saddam from flying and uh, killing people in northern Iraq. Do you know how effective closing off the airspace to Russian aircraft would be in Ukraine itself when they're being, you know, they got missile attacks from long, long range missiles, they've got artillery go going over the border and all kinds of different threats that aren't exactly aircraft? Well, um, it's an excellent question, and you raise a very good point. Um, the majority of the carnage that is being caused by the Russians against the Ukrainian people and their infrastructure um, is with artillery. Um, so you're, you're not stopping artillery with the, putting a no-fly zone in place. Um, however, uh, sort of the number one tenant of any successful military operation is to secure control of over the air. Uh, and that's where, uh, you know, a, a no fly zone has become a term of use, uh, but it is essentially, an, uh, in this case, it would be an air supremacy operation where you would ensure that no Russian aircraft could fly or missiles uh, in Ukrainian airspace. Uh, but once again, this is a full out combat operation uh, and it certainly wouldn't halt um, artillery strikes, but it would enable uh, the, the combatants, in this case, Ukrainians, and if no, um, NATO got drawn into it, to be able to attack um, those uh, artillery sites uh, in forces on the ground. That's why air superiority is so important because it enables the, the, the side that has that air superiority freedom uh, to attack the adversary from the air. And just this week, we, there have been plans that, that may or may not go forward of getting more and more planes to Ukraine, to Ukraine fighter pilots. Are you saying that's the better answer is just getting more, more planes, more air force to, to get that air superiority? Well, you know, the transfer of the 28 MiG 29s that are now in Poland to Ukraine should have been a no brainer. Uh, and it should have happened without all the fanfare that's going on in the media. Uh, and it should have been done quietly. In general, what are some lessons learned from your time running a no fly zone in Northern Iraq? Um, I, I think it's a, uh, it's important, and I'll kind of wrap this up, to recognize that a no-fly zone is an air occupation of someone else's sovereign country with attendant consequences. And the establishment of a no-fly zone over Ukraine would unquestionably be a major escalation where Ukraine would, would gain NATO as a co-belligerent but without the precursor of a formal alliance. So in effect, this political use of air power would mirror the entangling alliances that brought Europe into World War I, and that's something that we simply don't want to repeat. And sir, we're going to see how, how this plays out. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thanks for coming on the show. You bet. Thank you, Daniel. Have a great day. You too. And now we go to industry news.
first B-21 Raider bomber has entered the ground test phase for its expected rollout this year. In subsequent first flight, Northrop Grumman now has six of the stealthy next generation aircraft in various stages of production. Tom Jones, Northrop's aeronautics systems president, confirmed it in a statement that the first Raider is now undergoing the ground tests. Palantir Technologies recently received a $34 million order supporting the modernization of a military network used to relay information across the globe. The Program Executive Office for Intelligence, Electronic Warfare, and Sensors announced that the Army Intelligence Data Platform deal includes software, training, cybersecurity, and help with testing and initial standup of the capability. An American subsidiary of Raphael Advanced Defense Systems received facility clearance. The Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency granted Raphael Systems Global Sustainment the clearance in February. Raphael is known for technologies that include missiles and air defense. That includes the Iron Dome system. The company partnered with Raytheon on Iron Dome production and plans to open a production system to build them in the United States. And now around the world. Nordic governments are scaling up defense cooperation and preparedness planning against the backdrop of regional tensions over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Nordic states are looking to accelerate the deepening of joint defense measures that may lead to more serious discussions around the need for a Nordic-style solution modeled on the North Atlantic Treaty Article 5, which considers an attack on one member state to be an attack on all states. Political leaders in Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo, and Copenhagen are becoming increasingly concerned that Ukraine may be a deliberate first step by Moscow to use the military force to reconstruct the Soviet Union empire that collapsed in 1991. Nordic suspicions, if proven accurate, would directly threaten the sovereignty of neighboring NATO-aligned Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Sweden and Finland have traditionally walked a fine line between lauding their close relationship with to NATO while maintaining that their citizens want to keep out of the alliance. If the report cites recent polls showing that up to 53% of Finns now support joining NATO. That's compared to only 19% support in 2017. Meanwhile, Swedes are now 41% in support of joining the alliance, compared to 35% since the Russians took over Crimea from Ukraine in 2014. And that wraps up industry news for this week. When we return, we get a frontline update from a Ukrainian defense expert. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. While NATO is currently monitoring the war in Ukraine, the member countries are not getting involved. It mostly is Ukrainian service members and civilians who are fighting on the front lines. Military Times Senior Managing Editor Howard Altman spoke to one Ukrainian defense expert about the conflict. Right, this is Howard Altman, Senior Managing Editor of Military Times. I'm here with Alexander Daniel who is in Ukraine right now. How are you doing today? We are great, you know, we're fighting for our fatherland and we're winning. What do you observe? I observe, you know, that uh, Ukrainian people, men and women who are stopping, you know, Russian tanks and uh, BTRs and BMPs, you know, shooting Russian helicopters, missiles, and, uh, you know, taking prisoners. Uh, yeah, and I can see that so-called Russian military who trying to destroy our cities by the, you know, artillery, who trying to surround our cities, who trying to make our people starving. And actually, I'm not quite sure, you know, how Nazi behave themselves in this, uh, you know, fields and forests 80 years ago, but it seems to be very similar or even maybe worse. So tell me, are you familiar with what President Zelensky said about foreign fighters starting to come to Ukraine to help? I heard that actually we had like more than three, uh, three dozen thousands, you know, applications uh, just, you know, two days ago. Uh, I don't know if anybody is in Ukraine right now, honestly, uh, but I know that a, a lot of guys, a lot of volunteers from Japan, for instance, which is actually a very neutral country since the Second World War, they're coming to join Ukrainian people in their fight for freedom and in their fight against this global evil, which is Russian Federation. 
Now, do you are you are you concerned that Russia, which has a very large military, is going to step up their activities and increase the uh, amount of troops and the amount of missiles and uh, aircraft attacks on Ukraine, Ukraine cities? I think that actually, in the sense of human power, it's highly unlikely because they actually concentrated almost everything they could use against Ukraine. Uh, of course, they have some reserves if they would start using conscripts, but even professional soldiers, young guys like 20, 21 years old, they are completely useless. It's rather a liability than a real, you know, striking force. So I think that uh, actually it's completely clear that Putin conducted suicide by attack on Ukraine. And you know that that was my, uh, you know, forecast for uh, that alleged, you know, invasion into Ukraine. And actually, if he would decide to send conscripts to Ukraine, it would be just additional uh, reason for Russian people to overthrow this bloody dictator sooner. Uh, so no, I don't think that it's, it's, it is an option. And I don't think that this is a threat. I agree that actually what is a huge problem for us right now is Russian missiles. And despite Russia already used a uh, significant uh, part of uh, the existing missile capabilities on Ukraine, uh, uh, it's like hundreds of calibers and Iskanders already. And you understand that actually this level of uh, uh, this level of use of that missiles is usually not for attacks on neighboring countries, but for confrontation with NATO, right? So actually right now, Ukraine is not just shield of Europe, but shield of NATO as well. And that's why, yeah, they can continue that, but I don't know for how long they can continue that because uh, even despite they have a big stock of missiles, uh, it's pretty expensive and we know numbers, right? I mean that, maybe one, two weeks of the same, you know, intensity and Russia will have no, no missiles at all. What would Ukraine like from the U.S. and its allies right now? We would like to see some balls, you know, actually. We would like to see some balls. We would like to see you, uh, you know, being ready to fight along us because this is not just our fight. And that bullshit about, you know, nuclear threat, uh, it's completely clear that Putin is mad and it is completely clear that Putin is mad uh, at least, you know, since 2014 and he annexed Crimea. And actually it, it means that he can and he will use nukes if we don't stop him, right? And we have to stop him altogether. And actually Ukrainians will definitely do it, you know? And right now the additional support, uh, no fly zone in Ukraine, you know, uh, uh, anti, you know, uh, uh, missile protection. This is what we need and actually do something, you know, be serious uh, because all of that, you know, killed Ukrainian kids. This is, of course, they are victims of uh, Putin and his, you know, Nazi policy, but uh, the lack of balls is also a part of the reasons, you know. And um, do you think U.S. troops should be on the ground in Ukraine? The defense secretary and the president have both said that is not going to happen. So I think that right now what we can do and what we should do, we have to change the rules for Security Council, UN Security Council. And it should be completely clear that if the country is an aggressor and if the country uh, is conducting, you know, war crimes and uh, and killing, you know, kids and civilians and conducting genocide. This country doesn't have any veto right, and it means that actually it could be just in two days. Then we would have, you know, that mandate for UN peacekeeping, you know, mission in Ukraine, and we can actually send that mission, you know, uh, to Ukraine immediately. And it's just a matter who would love to join that mission, right? So it's completely clear that it, it is possible. And again, it's not US forces. It's not, you know, NATO forces. This is UN forces like in Korea. And it is, it is possible to do, but it, it, it requires, you know, some balls, some balls. Sasha, thank you so very much.
stay safe and stay in touch. We'll, I'll be talking to you. Hope we see you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, Howard. When we return, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you her latest tips. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives her latest tips. The way we use our phones today, it should be no surprise that phone scams, or what's called voice phishing, is on the rise. Fraudsters will call pretending to be from your financial institution or even the Social Security Administration vishing for personal info. They do this by using phone numbers from your area code to trick you into believing the call is real so you'll pick up. Getting these calls can be annoying and nerve-wracking, but knowing how to recognize them can stop fraudsters in their tracks. Vishing calls follow a similar pattern. So if you get a call from someone representing your bank or credit union saying there's been suspicious activity on your account, asking you to provide a six-digit passcode, hang up immediately. Never provide any passcodes unless you've called in personally. And keep in mind, your financial institution will never call or text asking for personal info. And you should never be or feel pressured into downloading an app or resetting your personal info online. This is how fraudsters can take over your account. Always call to verify the need to make changes to your account settings before you do it. It's good to be skeptical of requests like this to keep your personal info private and secure until you've made the call yourself to a representative from your financial institution. Or you can always go to your nearest branch. By reporting vishing to your bank or credit union, you're doing your part in helping prevent others from being victims of fraud. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more of our coverage, be sure to check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. To get a list of our top stories in your inbox every weekday, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we return, we get an inside look at volunteer drone pilots helping Ukraine fight Russia. Welcome back, I'm Andrea Scott. Civilians are taking up arms in Ukraine, but drones? Yeah, those too. Here's a look inside their efforts. A month ago, Ukrainian drone pilots were flying for hobby and business. Now, they're flying into war. One business owner, Tara Storiak, sells drones. He sold out of the 300 in his inventory. They're still coming in as donations. We supply every day around 100 drones. And that charity they supply to uh, end users is civilian users, military users those drones and everybody st started to use these drones to find some enemies in our country and uh, it's uh, helpful and I know many examples when it saved uh, life of our Ukrainian people. The remote pilots are currently using the drones for reconnaissance. We have uh, drones with thermal cameras from DJI and from another brands as well that used at night so we see the soldiers at night, we see the tanks at night, and they all will be dead if they will, go, will not go back to Russia. And for sure, it's scary to use a drone when uh, you, you know, in Ukraine right now, because it's a huge risk for your life that you will be detected and destroyed by them. So you have to follow some rules to avoid to be detected. Drones have been used as weapons before. Encountering them can prove difficult. Peter Warner Singer is the author of Wired for War. So some of the, for example, DJI drones, they don't go over 40 miles per hour. Um, you're not gonna use a fighter jet to shoot it down. It'd be hard even for a helicopter. They're also, you know, they're like literally this big. So the responses to them range from, you know, old school using guns of some kind to what the U.S. military turned to was a variety of jammers, basically trying to go after either the signal that's controlling the drone from the human operator on the ground or going after the system itself, kind of overwhelming its electronics. 
And reportedly, the Russians have that kind of technology. Um, they've also, on this jammer side, we've seen images of, um, in their convoys, civilian vehicles that are not just about drone jamming, they're cell phone jamming. And we think this is gonna be one of the things that they deploy into these cities as they also deploy the rest of their tanks and the like. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.